The Japanned Box by Arthur Conan Doyle. It was a curious thing, said the private tutor. One of those grotesque and whimsical incidents which occur to one as one goes through life. I lost the best situation which I'm ever likely to have through it. But I am glad that I went to Thorpe Place, for I gained... Well, as I tell you the story, you will learn what I gained. I don't know whether you are familiar with that part of the Midlands which is drained by the Avon. It is the most English part of England. Shakespeare, the flower of the whole race, was born right in the middle of it. It is a land of rolling pastures, rising in higher folds to the westwards, until they swell into the Malvern Hills. There are no towns, but numerous villages, each with its grey Norman church. You have left the brick of the southern and eastern counties behind you, and everything is stone. Stone for the walls, and lichened slabs of stone for the roofs. It is all grim and solid and massive, as befits the heart of a great nation. It was in the middle of this country, not very far from Evesham, that Sir John Bollamore lived, in the old ancestral home of Thorpe Place. And thither it was that I came to teach his two little sons. Sir John was a widower. His wife had died three years before, and he had been left with these two lads, aged eight and ten, and one dear little girl of seven. Miss Witherton, who is now my wife, was governess to this little girl. I was tutor to the two boys. Could there be a more obvious prelude to an engagement? She governs me now, and I tutor two little boys of our own. But there, I have already revealed what it was which I gained from Thorpe Place. It was a very, very old house. Incredibly old. Pre-Norman, some of it. And the Bollamores claim to have lived in that situation since long before the conquest. It struck a chill to my heart when first I came there. Those enormously thick grey walls the rude crumbling stones, the smell as from a sick animal which exhaled from the rotting plaster of the aged building. But the modern wing was bright, and the garden was well kept. No house could be dismal which had a pretty girl inside it, and such a show of roses in the front. Apart from a very complete staff of servants, there were only four of us in the household. These were Miss Witherton, who was at that time four and twenty, and as pretty well, as pretty as Mrs. Colmore is now. Myself, Frank Colmore, aged thirty. Mrs. Stevens, the housekeeper, a dry, silent woman. And Mr. Richards, a tall, military-looking man who acted as steward to the Bollamore Estates. We four always had our meals together. But Sir John had his usually alone in the library. Sometimes he joined us at dinner, but on the whole we were just as glad when he did not for he was a very formidable person. Imagine a man, six feet three inches in height, majestically built, with a high-nosed aristocratic face, brindled hair, shaggy eyebrows, a small pointed Mephistophelian beard, and lines upon his brow and round his eyes as deep as if they had been carved with a penknife. He had grey eyes, weary, hopeless-looking eyes, proud and yet pathetic, eyes which claimed your pity, yet dared you to show it. His back was rounded with study, but otherwise he was as fine a looking man of his age, five and fifty perhaps, as any woman could wish to look upon. But his presence was not a cheerful one. He was always courteous, always refined, but singularly silent and retiring. I have never lived so long with any man and known so little of him. If he were indoors, he spent his time either in his own small study in the Eastern Tower or in the library in the modern wing. So regular was his routine that one could always say at any hour exactly where he would be. Twice in the day he would visit his study, once after breakfast and once about ten at night. You might set your watch by the slam of the heavy door. For the rest of the day he would be in his library. Save that for an hour or two in the afternoon he would take a walk or a ride which was solitary like the rest of his existence. He loved his children and was keenly interested in the progress of their studies, but they were a little awed by the silent, shaggy-browed figure, and they avoided him as much as they could. Indeed, we all did that. It was some time before I came to know anything about the circumstances of Sir John Bollamore's life, 
for Mrs. Stevens, the housekeeper, and Mr. Richards, the land steward, were too loyal to talk easily of their employer's affairs. As to the governess, she knew no more than I did, and our common interest was one of the causes which drew us together. At last, however, an incident occurred which led to a closer acquaintance with Mr. Richards, and a fuller knowledge of the life of the man whom I served. The immediate cause of this was no less than the falling of Master Percy, the youngest of my pupils, into the mill-race, with imminent danger both to his life and to mine, since I had to risk myself in order to save him. Dripping and exhausted, for I was far more spent than the child, I was making for my room when Sir John, who had heard the hubbub, opened the door of his little study and asked me what was the matter. I told him of the accident, but assured him that his child was in no danger, while he listened with a rugged, immobile face, which expressed in its intense eyes and tightened lips all the emotion which he tried to conceal. "'One moment. Step in here. Let me have the details,' said he, turning back through the open door. And so I found myself within that little sanctum, inside which, as I afterwards learned, no other foot had for three years been set, save that of the old servant who cleaned it out. It was a round room, conforming to the shape of the tower in which it was situated, with a low ceiling, a single narrow ivy-wreathed window, and the simplest of furniture. An old carpet, a single chair, a deal table, and a small shelf of books made up the whole contents. On the table stood a full-length photograph of a woman. I took no particular notice of the features, but I remember that a certain gracious gentleness was the prevailing impression. Beside it were a large black japanned box, and one or two bundles of letters or papers fastened together with elastic bands. Our interview was a short one, for Sir John Bollamore perceived that I was soaked, and that I should change without delay. The incident led, however, to an instructive talk with Richards, the agent, who had never penetrated into the chamber which chance had opened to me. That very afternoon he came to me, all curiosity, and walked up and down the garden path with me, while my two charges played tennis upon the lawn beside us. "'You hardly realise the exception which has been made in your favour," said he. "'That room has been kept such a mystery, and Sir John's visits to it have been so regular and consistent, that an almost superstitious feeling has arisen about it in the household.' I assure you that if I were to repeat to you the tales which are flying about, tales of mysterious visitors there, and of voices overheard by the servants, you might suspect that Sir John had relapsed into his old ways. Why do you say relapsed? I asked. He looked at me in surprise. Is it possible, said he, that Sir John Bollamore's previous history is unknown to you? Absolutely. You astound me. I thought that every man in England knew something of his antecedents. I should not mention the matter if it were not that you are now one of ourselves, and the facts might come to your ears in some harsher form if I was silent upon them. I always took it for granted that you knew that you were in the service of Devil, Bollimore. But why Devil? I asked. Ah, you were young, and the world moves fast. But twenty years ago, the name of Devil Bollimore was one of the best known in London. He was the leader of the fastest set, bruiser, driver, gambler, drunkard, a survival of the old type, and as bad as the worst of them. I stared at him in amazement. What? I cried. That quiet, studious, sad-faced man? The greatest rip and debauchee in England. All between ourselves, Colmore. But you understand now what I mean when I say that a woman's voice in his room might even now give rise to suspicions. But what can have changed him so? Little Beryl Clare. When she took the risk of becoming his wife, that was the turning point. He had got so far that his own fast set had thrown him over. There is a world of difference, you know, between a man who drinks and a drunkard. They all drink, but they taboo a drunkard. He had become a slave to it, hopeless and helpless. Then she stepped in, saw the possibilities of a fine man in the wreck, took her chance in marrying him, though she might have had a, the pick of a dozen, and by devoting her life to it, brought him back to manhood and decency. You have observed that no liquor is ever kept in the house. 
There never has been any since her foot crossed its threshold. A drop of it would be like blood to a tiger, even now. Then her influence still holds him. That is the wonder of it. When she died three years ago, we all expected, and feared, that he would fall back into his old ways. She feared it herself, and the thought gave a terror to death, for she was like a guardian angel to that man, and lived only for the one purpose. By the way, did you see a black japanned box in his room? Yes. I fancy it contains her letters. If ever he has occasion to be away, if only for a single night, he invariably takes his black japanned box with him. Oh, well, Colmore, perhaps I have told you rather more than I should, but I shall expect you to reciprocate if anything of interest should come to your knowledge. I could see that the worthy man was consumed with curiosity, and just a little piqued that I, the newcomer, should have been the first to penetrate into the untrodden chamber. But the fact raised me in his esteem, and from that time onwards I found myself upon more confidential terms with him. And now... The silent and majestic figure of my employer became an object of greater interest to me. I began to understand that strangely human look in his eyes, those deep lines upon his careworn face. He was a man who was fighting a ceaseless battle, holding at arm's length from morning till night a horrible adversary who was forever trying to close with him, an adversary which would destroy him body and soul could it but fix its claws once more upon him. As I watched the grim, round-backed figure pacing the corridor or walking in the garden, this imminent danger seemed to take bodily shape, and I could almost fancy that I saw this most loathsome and dangerous of all the fiends crouching closely in his very shadow, like a half-cowed beast which slinks beside its keeper, ready at any unguarded moment to spring at his throat. And the dead woman, the woman who had spent her life in warding off this danger, took shape also to my imagination, and I saw her as a shadowy but beautiful presence, which intervened forever, with arms uplifted to screen the man whom she loved. In some subtle way he divined the sympathy which I had for him, and he showed in his own silent fashion that he appreciated it. He even invited me once to share his afternoon walk, and although no word passed between us on this occasion, it was a mark of confidence which he had never shown to, to any one before. He asked me also to index his library. It was one of the best private libraries in England, and I spent many hours in the evening in his presence, if not in his society, he reading at his desk, and I sitting in a recess by the window, reducing to order the chaos which existed among his books. In spite of these close relations, I was never again asked to enter the chamber in the turret. And then came my revulsion of feeling. A single incident changed all my sympathy to loathing, and made me realise that my employer still remained all that he had ever been, with the additional vice of hypocrisy. What happened was as follows. One evening, Miss Witherton had gone down to Broadway, the neighbouring village, to sing at a concert for some charity, and I, according to my promise, had walked over to escort her back. The drive sweeps round under the eastern turret and I observed as I passed that the light was lit in the circular room. It was a summer evening, and the window, which was a little higher than our heads, was open. We were, as it happened, engrossed in our own conversation at the moment, and we had paused upon the lawn which skirts the old turret, when suddenly something broke in upon our talk and turned our thoughts away from our own affairs. It was a voice, the voice undoubtedly of a woman, it was low, so low that it was only in that still night air that we could have heard it. But hushed as it was, there was no mistaking its feminine timbre. It spoke hurriedly, gaspingly for a few sentences, and then was silent. A piteous, breathless, imploring sort of voice. Miss Witherton and I stood for an instant, staring at each other. Then we walked quickly in the direction of the hall door. It came through the window, I said. We must not play the part of eavesdroppers, she answered. We must forget that we have ever heard it. There was an absence of surprise in her manner which suggested a new idea to me. You have heard it before, I cried. I could not help it. My own room is higher up on the same turret. It has happened frequently. Who can the woman be? I have no idea. I had rather not discuss it. 
Her voice was enough to show me what she thought. But granting that our employer led a double and dubious life, who could she be, this mysterious woman who kept him company in the old tower? I knew from my own inspection how bleak and bare a room it was. She certainly did not live there. But in that case, where did she come from? It could not be any one of the household. They were all under the vigilant eyes of Mrs. Stevens. The visitor must come from without. But how? And then suddenly I remembered how ancient this building was, and how probable that some medieval passage existed in it. There is hardly an old castle without one. The mysterious room was the basement of the turret, so that if there were anything of the sort it would open through the floor. There were numerous cottages in the immediate vicinity. The other end of the secret passage might lie among some tangle of bramble in the neighbouring copse. I said nothing to anyone, but I felt that the secret of my employer lay within my power. And the more convinced I was of this, the more I marvelled at the manner in which he concealed his true nature. Often, as I watched his austere figure, I asked myself if it were indeed possible that such a man should be living this double life, and I tried to persuade myself that my suspicions might after all prove to be ill-founded. But there was the female voice. There was the secret nightly rendezvous in the turret chamber. How could such facts admit of an innocent interpretation? I conceived a horror of the man. I was filled with loathing at his deep, consistent hypocrisy. Only once during all those months did I ever see him without that sad but impassive mask which he usually presented towards his fellow man. For an instant I caught a glimpse of those volcanic fires which he had damped down so long. The occasion was an unworthy one, for the object of his wrath was none other than the aged charwoman whom I have already mentioned as being the one person who was allowed within his mysterious chamber. I was passing the corridor, which led to the turret, for my own room lay in that direction, when I heard a sudden startled scream, and merged in it the husky growling note of a man who is inarticulate with passion. It was a snarl of a furious wild beast. Then I heard his voice thrilling with anger. "'You would dare!' he cried. "'You would dare to disobey my directions!' "'An instant later the charwoman passed me, "'flying down the passage, white-faced and tremulous, "'while the terrible voice thundered behind her. "'Go to Mrs. Stevens for your money. "'Never set foot in Thought Place again!' "'Consumed with curiosity, "'I could not help following the woman, "'and found her round the corner, "'leaning against the wall and palpitating like a frightened rabbit.' "'What is the matter, Mrs. Brown?' I asked. "'It's Master,' she gasped. "'Oh, how he frightened me! "'If you had seen his eyes, Mr. Colmore, sir, "'I thought he would have been the death of me. "'But what had you done?' "'Done, sir? Nothing. "'At least nothing to make so much of. "'Just laid my hand on that black box of his. "'Hadn't even opened it. "'When in he came, and you heard the way he went on. "'I've lost my place, and glad I am of it.' "'for I would never trust myself within reach of him again. "'So it was the japanned box which was the cause of this outburst, "'the box from which he would never permit himself to be separated. "'What was the connection, or was there any connection, "'between this and the secret visits of the lady whose voice I had overheard? "'Sir John Bollamore's wrath was enduring as well as fiery, "'for from that day Mrs. Brown, the charwoman, vanished from our ken, "'and Thought Place knew her no more.' And now I wish to tell you the singular chance which solved all these strange questions and put my employer's secret in my possession. The story may leave you with some lingering doubts as to whether my curiosity did not get the better of my honour and whether I did not condescend to play the spy. If you choose to think so, I cannot help it, but can only assure you that, improbable as it may appear, the matter came about exactly as I describe it. The first stage in this denouement was that the small room in the turret became uninhabitable. This occurred through the fall of the worm-eaten oaken beam which supported the ceiling. Rotten with age, it snapped in the middle one morning and brought down a quantity of plaster with it. Fortunately, Sir John was not in the room at the time. His precious box was rescued from amongst the debris and brought into the library, where, henceforward, it was locked within his bureau. Sir John took no steps to repair the damage, 
and I never had an opportunity of searching for that secret passage, the existence of which I had surmised. As to the lady, I had thought that this would have brought her visits to an end, had I not one evening heard Mr. Richards asking Mrs. Stevens who the woman was whom he had overheard talking to Sir John in the library. I could not catch her reply, but I saw from her manner that it was not the first time that she had had to answer, or avoid, the same question. "'You've heard the voice, Colmore?' said the agent. I confessed that I had. "'And what do you think of it?' I shrugged my shoulders, and remarked that it was no business of mine. "'Come, come, you are just as curious as any of us. Is it a woman or not?' "'It is certainly a woman. Which room did you hear it from?' "'From the turret room, before the ceiling fell. But I heard it from the library only last night. I passed the door as I was going to bed, and I heard someone wailing and praying just as plainly as I hear you. "'It may be a woman. Why, what else could it be?' He looked at me hard. "'There are more things in heaven and earth,' said he. "'If it is a woman, how does she get there?' "'I don't know. "'No, nor I. "'But if it is the other thing... "'Ah, but there, for a practical businessman at the end of the nineteenth century, "'this is rather a ridiculous line of conversation.' He turned away, but I saw that he felt even more than he had said. "'To all the old ghost stories of Thorpe Place, "'a new one was being added before our very eyes.' It may by this time have taken its permanent place, for though an explanation came to me, it never reached the others. And my explanation came in this way. I had suffered a sleepless night from neuralgia, and about midday I had taken a heavy dose of chlorodyne to alleviate the pain. At that time I was finishing the indexing of Sir John Bollamore's library, and it was my custom to work there from five till seven. On this particular day, I struggled against the double effect of my bad night and the narcotic. I have already mentioned that there was a recess in the library, and in this it was my habit to work. I settled down steadily to my task, but my weariness overcame me, and, falling back upon the settee, I dropped into a heavy sleep. How long I slept, I do not know, but it was quite dark when I awoke. Confused by the chlorodyne which I had taken, I lay motionless in a semi-conscious state. The great room, with its high walls covered with books, loomed darkly all around me. A dim radiance from the moonlight came through the farther window, and against this lighter background I saw that Sir John Bollamore was sitting at his study table. His well-set head and clearly cut profile were sharply outlined against the glimmering square behind him. He bent as I watched him, and I heard the sharp turning of a key and the rasping of metal upon metal. As if in a dream, I was vaguely conscious that this was the japanned box which stood in front of him, and that he had drawn something out of it, something squat and uncouth, which now lay before him upon the table. I never realised, it never occurred to my bemuddled and torpid brain that I was intruding upon his privacy, that he imagined himself to be alone in the room, and then, just as it rushed upon my horrified perceptions, and I had half risen to announce my presence, I heard a strange, crisp, metallic clicking, and then the voice. Yes, it was a woman's voice. There could not be a doubt of it. But a voice so charged with entreaty and with yearning love that it will ring forever in my ears. It came with a curious, far-away tinkle, but every word was clear, though faint, very faint, for they were the last words of a dying woman. "'I am not really gone, John,' said the thin, gasping voice. "'I am here, at your very elbow, and shall be until we meet once more. "'I die happy to think that morning and night you will hear my voice. "'Oh, John, be strong.' Be strong until we meet again. I say that I had risen in order to announce my presence, but I could not do so while the voice was sounding. I could only remain half lying, half sitting, paralysed, astounded, listening to those yearning, distant, musical words. And he, he who was so absorbed that even if I had spoken, he might not have heard me. But with the silence of the voice... 
came my half-articulated apologies and explanations. He sprang across the room, switched on the electric light, and in its white glare I saw him, his eyes gleaming with anger, his face twisted with passion, as the hapless charwoman may have seen him weeks before. "'Mr. Colmore!' he cried. "'You, here! What is the meaning of this, sir?' With halting words, I explained it all. My neuralgia, the narcotic, my luckless sleep and singular awakening. As he listened, the glow of anger faded from his face, and the sad, impassive mask closed once more over his features. "'My secret is yours, Mr. Colmore,' said he. "'I have only myself to blame for relaxing my precautions. "'Half confidences are worse than no confidences, and, "'and so you may know all, since you know so much. "'The story may go where you will when I have passed away, "'but until then I rely upon your sense of honour "'that no human soul shall hear it from your lips. "'I am proud still, God help me, or at least I am proud enough to resent that pity which this story would draw upon me. I have smiled at envy, and disregarded hatred, but pity is more than I can tolerate. You have heard the source from which the voice comes, that voice which has, as I understand, excited so much curiosity in my household. I am aware of the rumours to which it has given rise. These speculations, whether scandalous or superstitious, as such as I can disregard and forgive. What I should never forgive would be a disloyal spying and eavesdropping in order to satisfy an illicit curiosity. But of that, Mr. Colmore, I acquit you. When I was a young man, sir, many years younger than you are now, I was launched upon town without a friend or adviser, and with a purse which brought only too many false friends and false advisers to my side. I drank deeply of the wine of life, if there is a man living who has drunk more deeply, he is not a man whom I envy. My purse suffered, my character suffered, my constitution suffered. Stimulants became a necessity to me. I was a creature from whom my memory recoils. And it was at that time, the time of my blackest degradation, that God sent into my life the gentlest, sweetest spirit that ever descended as a ministering angel from above. She loved me broken as I was, loved me, and spent her life in making a man once more of that which had degraded itself to the level of the beasts. But a fell disease struck her, and she withered away before my eyes. In the hour of her agony, it was never of herself, of her own sufferings, and her own death, that she thought. It was all of me. The one pang which her fate brought her was the fear that when her influence was removed, I should revert to that which I had been. It was in vain that I made oath to her that no drop of wine would ever cross my lips. She knew only too well the hold that the devil had upon me, she who had striven so to loosen it, and it haunted her day and night, the thought that my soul might again be within his grip. It was from some friend's gossip of the sick-room that she heard of this invention, this phonograph, and with the quick insight of a loving woman she saw how she might use it for her ends. She sent me to London to procure the best which money could buy. With her dying breath she gasped into it the words which have held me straight ever since. Lonely and broken, what else have I in the world to uphold me? But it is enough. Please God, I shall face her without shame, when he is pleased to reunite us. That is my secret, Mr. Colmore, and whilst I live... I leave it in your keeping.'